I'm going to say a few inter because with so many people, I was going to to work in the information that I have on on uh, on lessing uh, my my ideas, and then we will uh, go to a close reading. So really, my my concern today, uh, so we're discussing Nathan de Weise by Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, who lived from 1729 to 1781, and who wrote this play in the last two years of his life under very difficult circumstances. And my goal tonight is to get a sense of how you read the play, what you think are the connections to 9-11, and then I am hoping to present a reading of the play since I'm expecting you to read the play very positively, and I would like to show some of the very pessimistic features that I think have been integrated into the play and actually are um, to some degree surprising to people who have been staging this play as a very hopeful play, and I hope I will succeed in showing that. So Lessing, as you know, was the first truly free-floating intellectual in Germany. And by free-floating, I mean that he was not integrated into any institutional structures. He was not a professor like Schiller or Gottsched or Fichte, nor was he employed as a court poet, politician, or theater director like Goethe at the court of Weimar. Lessing lived for most of his life outside any institutional structures, and he tried to make a living from writing. He was the first intellectual in Germany to try to make a living from writing. Since he was also a gambler, he was always poor, always on the brink of financial ruin, always in debt, and maybe for that reason, money plays such an enormous role in this play. If you think about the role of money in this play, it's astounding once you think about the power of this. The, play opens with a thought about money, with him coming back. We can look at the opening of the play, which is a sensational opening, really. Lessing knew something about the power of money and what money can do to you. Lessing was born into a Protestant family in Saxony. His grandfather had been a free thinker who had written an essay on toleration, but his father, this was his grandfather, so his father was orthodox, which meant he was opposed to the Enlightenment ideas, which tried to square Enlightenment ideas, tried to square reason and religion. The father believed that the Bible was the word of God, literally the word of God, and was revealed by God. We have an allusion to Mount Sinai when the temple ha is speaking here by God, and that salvation came from a commitment to Christ as Savior. Lessing was one of 12 children, not all of whom survived to adulthood. He was fortunate to get a scholarship to attend a very good boarding school, St. Afrin, where he is near Meissen, where he received a superb education. He studied well and petitioned to be released from school a year early in 1746 because he really couldn't take it anymore. He went to Leipzig after he was, in fact, released um, a year early to study theology because his father had asked him to do it, and there was always, and that was very important for one who came from a fairly poor family, there was always a job for theologians. But he was already, at that time, 1746, 1747, when he goes to study, in the grip of theater, he starts writing plays. And his first play is called Der Junge Gelehrte, The Young Scholar. And it is performed by a very famous theater troupe, the troupe of the Neuberin, if you, those of you who know a little bit about theater history. And it was performed in 1748, when Lessing was actually only 19 years old. So he had a, a play performed, totally penniless guy, um, a, a student of theology when he was 19 years old. And of course, his parents hear about it. And, in, and order him to come home stat. They write to Lessing and that his mother is very sick and that she may die. And so Lessing, of course, being a dutiful son, he's the oldest surviving son, actually, uh, he goes home and he finds that it's a lie. So to make it up to their son, because their parents see that he's very upset, the parents pay his debts, which are very considerable at the time, and uh, they also agreed to his plan to switch from theology to medicine. A little later, I think this is in, in uh, January 1749, he writes a very, I think January 10, in fact, uh, 1749, he writes a letter that's become very, very famous, a letter to his mother in which he absolutely forbids her to meddle anymore in his life. 
a very famous letter of a declaration of independence from parental guidance, or from actually the mother trying to meddle. She was even more, um, you know, more conservative than the father, and that time he was um, about 20 years old. In August 1748, he begins his studies of medicine, uh, but he needs to use the money that he had for tuition to pay more of his debts, and that puts an end to his studies. He moves to Berlin and begins his career as a free writer and intellectual with doing French, translations from French into German and in fact also translates some of the works of Voltaire who has just arrived at the court and there were some complications with that because um, Lessing ran off with the manuscript of Voltaire. Voltaire had written a, a history of uh, Louis XIV and it was a history that was very critical and that wouldn't have been very nice if they, the, the Prussian king had learned about it and so he wanted to publish part of that and, and Voltaire got very upset because he wanted to publish it in France and so it was a whole mess and in the end it turns out that um, Lessing had to, return, had to return the manuscript and nothing of course came of actually being paid by Voltaire to do the translation and nothing came of the publication either. So that was his translation adventure. Eventually, Lessing realizes that he is not getting anywhere without a university degree, so we're really entering modern times now. You can't go anywhere if you haven't graduated from college or from university. And he completes his studies uh, in Wittenberg, of course, Luther's university in 1752. He returns to Berlin and becomes part of a circle of young intellectuals, book dealers, publishers, professors. Um, and toward the end of 1753, he meets Moses Mendelssohn, who was 24, like Lessing, so they're exactly the same age and who has been in Berlin uh, for 10 years since he arrived, as I said yesterday, in 1743. Lessing now develops a new form of theater, and that's very important for him. He said, yes, he's participating in all the intellectual discussions of the time, but he's really still in the grip of theater. And one of the fantastic ideas that he has, and that really made um, a huge impact and transformed theater um, extraordinarily, was that he adapts the idea of tragedy to the new middle class world. Tragedies used to be reserved for people of high social standing. They used to take place among the, among the select few, among the aristocracy, and only aristocrats, it was thought, could really experience true tragedy because they're so high, so can, they can fall very deep. Um, I'm trying to think of what the German, German formulation is, and it escapes me right now. Um, because they were pushed by fate, aristocrats, everybody who's an aristocrat has to be a decision maker as a politician, and in, in tragedies, uh, these high and mighty people are pushed by fate to have to make political decisions uh, that they really do not want to, to want to make. And for normal people like us, there would only be the morality play or comedy, and all of that really changes with Lessing. Uh, he changes this perception by developing the idea of what is called the bürgerliche Trauerspiel. The, um, the really, the, the um, how should I say it? There was a Trauerspiel, the sad play for sad sex, I don't know. So for middle class people, they finally have something where they are also shown to experience tragic situations. Did you, did you, could you think of what I was thinking of in the Deutsch? With the, with the, with the high and mighty, I, there, there was something that we, I don't know. I was, I was said, there's something that you always learn when you when you learn lessing in school. I would think of it of the German phrasing. So the personnel or the dramatis personae of these plays of sorrow, <laughs> the tragedies, uh, these bürgerliche Trauerspiele, um, ordinary middle class people, and that is an absolute revolution. That is a radical thing that you can show people who are ordinary people, who are merchants, who are just any any middle class people on stage and that you take them seriously. You have to imagine that this is what this does to democrat democrat democratization. Now Lessing's life was intellectually very complex and I will not go into that because we'll be sitting here next week. Um, because he participated in all the major discussions of his time and he met all the important writers and philosophers with the exception of Goethe and Schiller who were his younger contemporaries. Schiller actually liked Lessing's radicalism and Lessing w was radical because for him the idea of equality of people, the equality of people was fundamental. Schiller sort of agreed with that but Schiller played it very safe because he always needed employment and yeah, I like to live well, and he came from a poor family, but I also came from, from, from Schwabenland, who was from Swabia, and they like to work hard and they like to play it safe. So, he, so Schiller always went for freedom, which is kind of like non committal, you know, sort of Don Carlos, Sie geben Sie Gedankenfreiheit, uh, Sir, please give freedom of, 
of, of thought um, doesn't really commit you to anything, anyone to give them freedom of thought, okay? And freedom of decision-making, and uh, that's important to Schiller, and you can really see that Schiller is an idealist who doesn't really th think about how these, these ideas translate into social realities. Now, Lessing was a very different kettle of fish. As I told you, so he's, a, he's, a, he's a real guy, and he knows that money makes the world go round, and uh, for all his intellectualism, he's this realist because he needs to make money. He understands what it is to need to make money. He sees how society is structured because he, he comes from the, from, from the bottom up, and those having the money, he realizes it very, careful, very, very clearly, um, who, those who have the money and the power are not always the people who deserve it. He understands that the greatest threat, the greatest threat to the established order is not that some people want freedom, Freedom really is nothing if it does not come with personal security. You can be free as much as you want. If you don't have any money to go with it, you will just be on the side. Think of Al-Hafi or think of the uh, Klosterbruder, the monk who is in display. These are poor people. They have great ideas, but they are really nothing. They are marginalized. They leave society because they cannot implement those ideas. Um, the greatest threat to the established order an order with the aristocracy based uh, on heritage at the top and the peasants at the bottom is the claim that human beings are equal. That is, that they are created as of equal value to God, even if they turn out to be differently endowed. And this underlying motif of human equality is what put Lessing on a collision course with Orthodox Protestantism at the time and led to the writing of Natan. The big discussion, and now I'm going to do a little bit of intellectual history, the big discussion during the Enlightenment was how reason, how one's ability to think logically and scientifically could square with religion. That's the big deal. In fact, for the Jews, this begins with Maimonides. We already have this, in fact, in the Arab world, the Arab Enlightenment. Uh, we have this discussion already because the Arabs... Um, um, uh, thought about Aristotle and thought about the place of reason and they tried to square this with religion and we get it through Maimonides, the idea of squaring reason and religion, but it didn't really arrive in Christianity until the age of the Enlightenment. Yes, there's Descartes and there's um, Blaise Pascal and we have it a little bit, but the big discussion really in Germany in the 18th century is how can you square, uh, how can you think logically and still be committed uh, to religion? And this first victim, the first victim of reason, was not God, because he was simply uh, redefined. You get deism at this time, it's a different idea of God. But the idea that the Bible, this is the first victim of thinking scientifically of, of, about religion, the victim was that the idea that the Bible was literally the word of God that has been divinely revealed. So I mean, it's given to Moses by Mount Sinai or transmitted uh, to the disciples by the Holy Spirit, that idea falls by the wayside. The Enlighteners declared that this could not be so, that it is not possible, if you think about it scientifically and logically, that the Bible was revealed literally to Moses on Mount Sinai. That if reason was indeed a valid principle, this is the second thing that follows, it had to apply to everything which means there were no miracles. There couldn't be a resurrection. Those of you who studied Tolstoy with me, we know that in the very late in his life, he cleansed Christianity all of all of that. There was no resurrection, there were no miracles, and uh, actually developed to try to reduce Christianity to a set of moral principles by sort of doing away with all, all the resurrection and all the miracle stuff. And something like this actually happens uh, in the Enlightenment. So everything that Enlighteners say could be explained with the help of science and reason, and it stood to reason that the Bible was a great moral book, but written by human beings. Written by human beings. It was absolutely radical at the time. There was no such thing as divine revelation. This discussion we also have uh, in, in display. So you could say then, well, what's the big deal? I mean, we have all, I sort of think, I mean, maybe not in Texas, but here, um, accepted that, you know, there is, uh, you know, we've got a book and, and, you know, it's written by human beings. So why not concede that the Bible was written by human beings and, and who were, let's say, divinely inspired and they were great writers and they were great moralists and they were great lawgivers and all of that. Now the reason this became such a hot issue during the Enlightenment was that the entire social system